Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Clifton Otto, and I would like to talk to you about Medical Cannabis Day. This is a presentation that I gave just a couple of days ago to commemorate Medical Cannabis Day 2020. There have been a few revisions that I wanted to share with you. First of all, I'd like to thank Hawaii Patients Union and Brent Norris for making the virtual gathering that occurred on Medical Cannabis Day 2020 possible. I'd also like to thank Senator Russell Ruderman for not only participating in his event, but with all of his help at the state legislature. I'd also like to thank Mayor Kawakami, Mayor Kim, Mayor Caldwell, and Mayor Victorino, who I believe all issued Medical Cannabis Day proclamations this year. I'd also like to thank Governor Ige, although he was unable to approve our proclamation request this year, I'm very grateful that he uh, made dispensaries essential during the current shutdown. I'd also like to thank our dispensaries for doing everything they can to make sure that patients have safe access to medicine during these difficult times. And uh, most of all, I'd like to thank our patients who have endured and taught us so much over these past 20 years about how the medical use of cannabis has significantly improved the quality of their lives. A couple of quick disclosures. I am a certifying physician for Hawaii's medical cannabis program. I'm not a member or consultant for any dispensary, and I have no other financial interest to disclose. This presentation is for educational purposes only. Please keep in mind I am not a lawyer, and I recommend that you consult with a legal professional should you need uh, professional advice on the medical use of cannabis in Hawaii. A little bit about my background, I am a cannabinoid medicine specialist, which means that I have demonstrated competencies above the minimum standards required to practice uh, cannabinoid medicine in Hawaii, which means I've also been certified by the board of the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. I'm also a retina specialist who takes care of patients on the Big Island with diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration. And I've also uh, worked for Hawaii Therese Pharmaceuticals doing chemistry as well as the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, a little background in how I got involved in the medical use of cannabis. This was because of a friend who suffered from colorectal cancer. And I was able to see firsthand how he was able to gain pain relief, nausea reduction, and appetite stimulation that I believe allowed him to survive the grueling chemotherapy and surgeries that were involved. I then started looking at the science and I was amazed and how much research had already been done in this area, especially back in the 70s before the war on drugs shut down a lot of this important research. And then I started looking at our own Medical Use of Cannabis Act. And that's when I became a little bit of an advocate to try and protect the rights of our patients. This comes from the original 1999 Medical Use of Cannabis Bill. And you can see very clearly the intent of our lawmakers at that time, which was to promote Hawaii as being an international center for medical treatment and research regarding the medical use of cannabis, which I think was quite visionary at the time and something that I believe that we can still achieve. I'd like to give you a little bit of history on Medical Cannabis Day. It all started with a visit to the State Archives Building, which is really a fascinating uh, building. I would highly recommend it to anybody who has time to visit. You check in at the front desk, fill out an online questionnaire, try and stuff all your belongings to, into a little uh, locker by the front door. They do allow you to take in a cell phone uh, so that you can do photo documentations of any uh, documents that are retrieved. And the document I was uh, primarily interested in seeing was uh, Hawaii's Medical Use of Cannabis Act that was signed into law. And it was the last page of this, this act, SB 862, that, that really struck me when I saw that date, uh, June 14th, 2020, and Governor Cayetano's signature there, it all of a sudden occur occurred to me that this day might be a date that we could use to organize and promote awareness about things that needed to be improved uh, regarding Hawaii's medical cannabis program. The purpose of Medical Cannabis Day, as, as I created it, is to stand up for the state accepted medical use of cannabis and end the misconception that Hawaii's medical cannabis program violates federal law. This day, June 14, 2000, is uh, quite significant because it's the first time that Hawaii accepted the medical use of a Schedule I controlled substance, which has direct impact upon the federal, federal regulation of, of cannabis. Uh, this act was uh, 
codified into our Uniform Controlled Substances Act, HRS 329, Part 9, which reads medical use of cannabis. As you can see, it does not say botanical use of cannabis. It does not say medicinal use of cannabis. Very clearly states medical use of cannabis. And this is uh, based upon federalism, meaning the constitutionally uh, enacted balance of power between states and federal government. And under this balance of power, states have retained the authority to decide the medical use of controlled substances, which is why our state and nearly all of the other states in the nation have been able to create some form of medical cannabis program. And so I decided to do certain things that would allow Medical Cannabis Day to come into existence. The first thing I did was change the logo of my company to uh, popularize this concept of state accepted medical use. I designed and had uh, printed t-shirts that I gave out to patients and physicians and uh, even uh, dispensaries that uh, decided to wear on this day last year, 2019. I also looked at the states, uh, other states and, and when they had acted the, enacted their own programs and used this information to create a postcard that I also gave out to patients and physicians and went down to the state capitol, that wonderful fortress, and handed out to all of our state lawmakers and the lieutenant governor as well as Governor Ige. I also requested a, uh, a flag be flown in honor of Medical Cannabis Day uh, with Congresswoman Gabbard, who was kind enough to approve this request and uh, submit it for flag flying on June 14th, 2019. And this is that flag that was flown above the nation's capital on that day, which I think uh, provides a, a, a certain tangible quality to the Medical Cannabis Day. And this is a proclamation request that I also submitted to Governor Ige last year, which unfortunately was not approved. Um, the other ish interesting aspect of June 14th, 2000, is that it's also the day that Hawaii created a direct conflict with the federal regulation of the non-medical use of marijuana. Uh, the non-medical use of marijuana is still on the Schedule One list under uh, federal regulation, 21 uh, CFR 1308.11. However, the Federal Controlled Substances Act shows us that in order to be in Schedule One, a substance must not have any medical use. And there is a well-developed state medical use argument that I believe clearly shows that the state accepted medical use of cannabis does qualify as currently accepted medical use in treatment in the United States. And this is that statute, 21 USC H12. The authority of states to decide how controlled substances are used within the state is also supported by the Supreme Court case, Gonzalez versus Oregon 2006, where the court found that the Department of Justice, which includes the DEA, does not have the authority to declare illegitimate a standard of medical care accepted under state law. And so we have a very unfortunate situation right now where the federal regulation of the illegal non-medical use of marijuana is being unconstitutionally applied to the state authorized medical use of cannabis in Hawaii. And as a result, there has been this attitude, this kind of wink wink uh, allowance of so-called medical cannabis with the undercurrent uh, assumption that this is mainly just a program for young adults who want an excuse to be able to use recreational cannabis underneath the guise of medical use. And unfortunately, this, uh, this attitude and this stigma has caused incredible discrimination against our patients over the years. There are many unintended consequences. For example, not being able to get a job because a patient would fail a drug screening test, being terminated from employment or failing a urine drug test that is not designed to test for impairment in the workplace as intended by the federal drug-free workplace policy, being evicted from federally subsidized housing 
losing child custody hearings, being denied life insurance, not eligible for temp temporary disability insurance, unable to travel to other islands with their medicine, and unable to obtain firearms permits for hunting, which can be essential for some patients in the outer islands who survive in part off of their hunting. In terms of the University of Hawaii system, they are unable to participate in any state level medical research on cannabis because of fear of losing federal funding. And our dispensaries, unable to engage in normal banking activities, unable to accept normal credit cards, and operating what is believed to be, and what has been found in other states, especially Iowa, to be a tax burden of approximately 70%. I don't know how any business is able to survive under such a severe tax burden, which inevitably ends up being passed on to our patients. So we need to look at solutions for this current conflict. And one solution may come from a federal exemption that already exists. This is a Schedule I exemption for the ceremonial use of peyote by members of the Native American church that has been on the books since the 70s. So if a church can enjoy this type of exemption, why can't a state? Here's another possible way to deal with this conflict. This is the federal exemption bill that was introduced this session, SB 2462, which would require, and request is not the right word here because this is a situation that already exists. The Department of Health needs to obtain from the D Drug Enforcement Administration a federal Schedule I exemption for the medical use of cannabis in Hawaii in order to remove this current conflict with the federal regulation of the non-medical use of marijuana. I've also inquired with our State Attorney General's office to ask for guidance on solutions that the state can act upon in order to address this current conflict. And we are still waiting for a response. And so we need to look at steps that we can take to ensure that our patients have access to this state authorized medicine for legitimate medical purposes. One way might be to resurrect the provision within this session's federal exemption bill. This bill was heard by one of the Senate's committees. It was deferred, but my understanding is the fact that it was heard means that this provision is fair game for inclusion in existing bills. I'm also hoping that it might be possible to have a stakeholders meeting, perhaps with some of the other mayors on other islands to address solutions for this current conflict. And of course, a lot of this comes down to our patients. I know that patients are very busy just trying to survive and stay healthy and provide for themselves. But we really need others who are being affected by this issue to raise the volume and patient, patiently but persistently make our state officials know that this is a problem that needs to be fixed. We are in a very unique situation in Hawaii, being an island state where we can exquisitely control our borders and protect the interstate medical use of cannabis, which in the end could help both our state as a whole and our patients. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you will all be safe, happy, and healthy. If you need more information, please feel free to contact me below or visit the website, the Medical Cannabis Day website. Thanks again for your attention. Aloha. That was really a jam-packed presentation. We'll need, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll need some time to unpack all of that and, and we'll continue the discussion uh, for uh, weeks to come um, and especially follow up on those next steps. But thanks so much for all your hard work. I, I, I did have just one quick question. It looked like um, Congresswoman Gabbard was going to fly the American flag over the Capitol building again this year. Um, is, is, did she confirm that with you? Well, I, I did receive confirmation from one of her staff 
that it has been approved and, and submitted to the office that actually makes the flag flying happen. I have provided uh, some of that update on, on the website uh, listed below. Along with the wording, we did a little bit differently today in a way that I think uh, more fully recognizes the state accepted medical use of cannabis in Hawaii. Wow, that's fantastic. I, I really, really appreciate that. And that's a way for um, us to all sort of celebrate um, the acceptance, I guess. So thank you. Thank you for all of your work on this and, and for putting together Medical Cannabis Day. And um, My pleasure. I, Thanks for having me. I'm sorry? My pleasure. Thanks very much for making this happen and for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll hang around uh, till the end when we open up for some more questions. I might shed my jacket and tie, but don't be surprised. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> and and uh, just a special shout out to Russell. I'm wearing a very special tie today. Oh, <laughs> I need to see it better. <laughs> yeah, tell us about it. So this was a gift from a friend, and it is designed by one of my favorite musicians of all time, Jerry Garcia. Nice to see that, uh, Cliff. I'm usually wearing his ties at the Senate myself. Although, uh, <laughs> of course, he never wore a tie, but um, So I just wanted to um, also, uh, make the connection here between Medical Cannabis Day, uh, the Hawaii Patients Union, Dr. Otto, and uh, Senator Ruderman. Um, Senator Ruderman, Joyce Ann Buenaventura, uh, William Collins, uh, and Daniel Mori uh, were all in the room when the Hawaii Patients Union um, was formed. And uh, so that was uh, about four years ago three and a half, four years ago. And last year for Medical Cannabis Day, Senator Ruderman spoke um, on behalf of patients and four patients, uh, the Moku Papapa -pa Discovery Center in Hilo, where we celebrated uh, a physical event. And of course this year, uh, that's not possible yet. Um, so we're here and Senator Ruderman, uh, you have, also been responsible for uh, legalization bills for the original federal exemption bill and um yeah so i'll just turn it over to you uh so thank you for being here and uh, uh if you have a few words to say i you know i'm sure we would all really appreciate it well thank you Brent, and thank you dr otto for uh, your presentation but all you've done to push this forward and as I'll get to in a minute, I think Dr. Otto is completely correct. And our failure to uh, fix some of the legal fixable problems he's been pointing out totally lies with the resistance to change of those of us at the legislature and not the correctness, either legally or morally, of the things uh, doctors are talking about of what we need to do in our state. So I appreciate all his work in pushing us this far. It hasn't been easy, I'm sure. Anyway, thank you for having me, Brent. I'm Russell Ruderman. I'm state senator from the Pune and Ka'u districts, and I just wanted to give my, a little bit of perspective and try not to take up too much time. I've watched the legislature, you know, slowly, and I wasn't there when we enacted the medical uh, marijuana bill, but I, w I have been there through the process of uh, opening up dispensaries. And I've watched that process happen. Very early on in that process, my first year there, actually, I was contacted by a medical, we were calling it medical marijuana at the time, uh, patient in my district. And I'd like to tell this story because it really uh, opened my eyes to, on a really human level, to the importance of this medicine. Back in a time when, uh, as doctor was saying, people were mostly still snickering about it when it came up at all. So this is a fellow who's in my district. He's you know, my neighbor. Uh, and my constituent, and he contacted me and said, I'm a little bit new in the area. I have a medical license. I have a serious disability that it helps me with, but I can't find it because this was, uh, you know, years before any dispensaries were open. He asked me if I would help him, and I just stopped by to meet him because I wanted to meet him first. So I stopped by, met him in his front yard, and he's a 
turned out to be a, about my age. He's a disabled veteran. And uh, he showed, he pulls out of one pocket. He showed me his disabled veteran card and he showed me his medical license. And then he says, you know, I haven't been able to find uh, cannabis since I moved here. And so I have to take this stuff when I can't find it. And he pulls out of his other pocket two prescription bottles. And I'm afraid I might get the names wrong. It's been about seven years, but they were two heavy duty opiates for his constant pain. He says, when I can't find cannabis, I end up taking this stuff. I hate it. Now we know a little bit more about the opiates. And this guy was telling me, when it, because he can't have access to cannabis legally, he has to take these two opioids. And it just drove the point home for me how serious this issue is on a human and medical scale. I, all, I think that we as a legislature and as a state government have done a terrible job of implementing the, um, the dispensary aspect of things. You know, we, our intention was let's make medical cannabis safely available to people. I was there, that was our intention, period. And then some other people took that and said, oh, I think they meant make it really hard to get. I think they meant make it almost impossible to grow in a cost-effective manner. I think they meant put more restrictions on it than we have on fentanyl. You know, I think they meant, you know, make sure it takes years at best to open up. And I, and I, and I think they meant that we shouldn't make smokable, uh, uh, smokable forms available. And I think they meant we shouldn't make edible forms available. This was all a couple of people's opinion. It's not what we meant. It's not what we wrote in the law. And I, I'm glad the dispensaries are, are here to tell, you know, again, their story, because they have had restrictions and costs and burdens put on them. They're just totally unreasonable if our intention is to make medical cannabis safely available. Uh, you know, I'll just point to one restriction. which un It's unbelievable that we had to legislate this. But originally, the dispensaries had to be built with the, not just 20 foot walls, but their roof covered, no sunshine allowed in. So I think they all went with those plants because that's what was allowed at the time. A year or so later, I argued vociferously for the fact that maybe sunlight is good for growing plants. Maybe we can make this work somehow and keep our community safe. And I think it wasn't in time to build any of the dispensaries that way, but that's how ridiculous it is. Okay, I'll stop harping on that for a minute. I do think it's getting better gradually. The thing that Dr. Ade was talking about, how when medical cannabis comes up, first everybody snickers and tells a couple of jokes. I think we're gradually getting past that phase, you know? And I think that um, there's gradually fewer restrictions and fewer resistance to it. You know, that said, we're still going much too slow. And we're still making this very, very safe substance like impossibly difficult to obtain in some areas and for some people. So that said, you know, I just wanted to say thanks again, Brent, and people who, uh, with your patients union and the things you're doing to advance this cause and Dr. Otto and everyone else involved in this is pushing this forward. You know, the, the intransigence and the lack of action, action on behalf of our state health committees, our state health director, and our attorney general, uh, by failing to solve this very simple fixable problem that Dr. has pointed out, you know, it's inexcusable, and I hope we get over it soon. I want to thank you guys for pushing, pushing the envelope to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Senator. I really appreciate that. Um, without having some communication between the the Senate and the, the House and patient associations, unions, uh, none of the progress would really be possible. So thank you for being a conduit for good. And uh, yeah, and thank you for sharing that story as well. I, I think a lot of us uh, have heard similar stories. So really grateful for, for your sharing that. Um, we have scheduled, um, uh, Hawaiian ethos, 
Um, but I'm not seeing Hawaiian ethos in the room. So if you are here, please turn on your video, uh, Diana or Allison, and uh, we'll get you on. Uh, if not, we're going to keep going down the list and we'll skip to our 1045 with Jacqueline Moore from Big Island Grown. Uh, Jacqueline is the CEO of Big Island Grown and uh, looks like you're coming to us from your home today, Jack. I am. I am. So first, I want to say thank you so much for sending out the invite. Um, we're really happy that we can participate. So thank you, Brent. Um, Dr. Otto, I just have to say you've been tremendous. Uh, your tireless efforts to really advocate for patients and to really um, do what's right as far as, uh, you know, trying to be congruent with, um, you know, the federal and state laws. Um, really paving the way for a level of legitimacy uh, that I think, um, you know, you're, you're pushing hard and I really, you know, we really appreciate your efforts. And then, um, you know, Russell Ruderman, I just have to say you were spot on with everything that you said. I couldn't agree more with you and I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more. So I practiced community pharmacy in the same community in Waimea for 12 years. And in that time, I dispensed a tremendous amount of opiate C2 prescriptions. It was unbelievable how quickly uh, somebody goes from something like naproxen or naproxen over to, you know, a hydrocodone APAP combination and then to oxycodone immediate release five milligrams. The transition up happened so very quickly. And what I've witnessed and seen is these cycles with patients who are desperate to get off of opiates and just completely within the current infrastructure that they're dialed into being a, you know, a, a right, traditional medicine, I'll say that, uh, have been painfully, um, uh, you know, kind of just left um, to their own, you know, their own uh, ways of dealing with it. So it was one of the reasons why I transitioned over and I'm uh, very, very happy uh, that I was able to participate not only in the application process for this license, but also in the vision of what we were trying to do, the legitimacy that we were trying to bring to it, and also understanding that we were there to provide legal infrastructure for patients. Uh, we understand and completely support a patient's right to grow. If Why would you not grow your own if you could? We are there for patients that have either tried to grow um, you know, they want to come in for convenience, for quality, whatever it is, but we are an extension and a legal avenue for patients to come in and to access cannabis. So speaking on um, Senator Ruderman's uh, uh, point about how difficult within the current system, you know, the, these barriers are, you know, we've witnessed how, you know, it, it takes up at one point, it was five or six weeks to get your medical card. Um, and that was really the processing on the Department of Health side. So not to say anything negative or bad, but I mean, it was, it was, you know, it's based on resources and things like this, but this is one of the things that doesn't make any sense to me. When you have a patient, you become a patient when your doctor deems you a patient, not when the state recognizes you as a registered patient. There's, there's a huge, there's been times where patients have gone to get certified, and then there's weeks of a time lapse before they're actually able to come in and purchase. I think that's something that really has to be addressed. When we saw what was happening with COVID, this is excellent examples. We were, what, there's 24 states, medical states, that, were, that allowed curbside pickup, that allowed for delivery. We advocated for these things as an industry, and we were denied these things. Now, I will say that I am extremely appreciative and, and thankful for the patients that we were deemed essentially medically, um, essential medical business, um, which I do feel like provides uh, at least an acknowledgement of the legitimacy of what medical cannabis is doing for patients. So I was happy about that. Um, but I did see how there was hospice patients. There were patients in desperate need who could not get a card or certified during this time because of what was happening. And these are the patients that we really were doing this the patients that need it most. You know, we had a, a proclamation that allowed for the exemption of telemedicine for other controlled substances. 
And unfortunately, medical cannabis was left out of that. Um, I think we need to revisit these very fundamental um, you know, approaches to this as a medicine to be completely consistent with the way we're handling other controlled substances. Until we make the infrastructure as easy for a patient to gain medical cannabis as it is to get an opiate, I don't think we are satisfying serving patients in their best interest at this, you know, to their highest interest. I shouldn't say their best interest, but definitely to their highest interest. We could do a lot more. Um, and so I just want to say we're thankful to the patients that support us. We're doing everything we can. We do listen to all the feedback that you guys provide. It's, it's, it's really helped us navigate. Um, through the complexities of this um, and uh, just want to share the love and thank you guys so much. Aloha. Wow, thank you so much, Jacqueline. That was really, really a great message. Um, uh, I know that a lot of patients are really going to appreciate that. So thank you so much and uh, we really appreciate you being here and for sharing that. Um, yeah, what a great message. Uh, up next, uh, we've, we've got um, Gail from the Hawaii Hemp Farmers Association, and uh, I, hope that, um, I hope that you're ready to follow up on something like that, Gail. That was a pretty good one. Um, do you have your, uh, thank you again, uh, Jacqueline from Big Island Grown. We'll, um, we'll post this and, and uh, share information about your dispensary, um, of course, through the ongoing discussion. Um, and Thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, so up next, Gail from Hawaii Hemp Farmers Association. I see Cab as well. Uh, thank you both for joining us today. And um, we realize that hemp farming has uh, a huge impact on uh, medical patients that need CBD and need other cannabinoids. Um, and together with the dispensary model and the hemp farming model, uh, it would be really great. I know a lot of people are calling on us to um, meet all of the demands of patients by providing enough CBD oil. Um, but I also understand that the program itself for growing hemp um, isn't exactly where we need it to be. So. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about um, patients and how uh, hemp farming uh, fits in with our needs? I can certainly address farming and good morning everyone. Thanks for being here and I want to um, thank Greg Smith. I think he's also on and he'll probably want to jump in after a few minutes um, because he uh, extended an invitation to me to be here today because I've been pretty active in legislation this last year on, or on behalf of the Hawaii Hemp Farmers Association. Um, my background's actually in civil engineering and um, I've been involved in our community in a variety of ways, including um, protecting agricultural land, and, um, open spaces. Um, my husband here to the left, a lot of you folks know, um, he's been farming organically here on the island for 40 plus years and uh, co-founded the Hawaii Organic Farmers Association. So he has really deep agricultural roots. Um, so uh, with regard to, I'll talk a little bit about hemp farming and maybe where we're at in terms of the state compared to other places. Um, and then I'm sure Greg might want to chime in for a few minutes to talk about things if, that, if that's helpful. And feel free to um, moderate or direct me, Brent, if you'd like. <laughs> Since hemp is just a, is a different beast, obviously, than um, medical marijuana, for sure. Um, and as you guys know, uh, hemp runs a spectrum from um, exceeding the legal limit and definitions for hemp at 0.3% THC to having absolutely none in there. And the uses of um, uh, hemp are extraordinary. You know, traditionally has been used for 50,000 years, at least documented for, um, by humans, um, cultivated that long for uh, use for a variety of things. And the modern uses for hemp and being able to shift these islands towards greater um, sustainability, not just the medical aspect, <clears throat> excuse me, the medical aspects is quite extraordinary. And I know that's why my husband got involved decades ago, because there was no talk of cannabinoids and CBD when they started the Hawaii Hemp Council, you know, decades ago. It was really about moving out of sugar cane towards something that could help these animals. So um, we uh, were able to pass the, the first legislation to allow 
uh, hemp growing in, in Hawaii. I think it finally was signed into law in 2016, but I know farmers around the state, um, basically led by my husband here through the Hawaii Farmers Union United, um, organized and um, worked for several years to get the bill passed to allow them to allow a pilot program here under the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, that pilot program has it's been successful in the sense that we've been able to grow hemp but it's also been very challenging because we have the most restrictive program right off the bat than any other state um, in the country. Um, a lot of that was because our program was set up to mitigate for risk, legal risk to the state, as a, maybe as opposed to looking at what farmers might need in furthering the industry. Um, and that, with the passage of the 2018 U.S. Uh, Farm Bill, that, um, that changed a little bit, made things easier for us, including being able to bring more varieties of hemp in. Greg can probably speak to the challenges we had in trying to <laughs> develop grains. Um, we were very limited in the beginning, and, and thanks to Greg's uh, kind of pioneering work, we, we do have some options now. Um, so, so where are we now? There's about uh, almost 50 licensed hemp farmers in the state. There's about 200 acres um, under cultivation. Um, there's a ton of interest in growing hemp in Hawaii for cannabinoids and for other purposes, including fiber, because it's a food, it's a fuel, it be used for a lot of different things. Um, but because folks have not been able to figure out the Hawaii program, <laughs> it's, it's, it's stymied things a little bit. Um, we're about ready to flip to the other end of that, I'm, I'm afraid, which could have a huge impact on Hawaii farmers. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So, um, so where we're at right now is um, we, we have, with the restrictions that we have on the current program, we're not able to actually legally move our biomass off the farm or process it or even sell hemp products officially legally, um, uh, including cannabinoid products. Uh, although you'll find them for sale in almost, you know, gas stations and many, many stores around the state um, and certainly online. Um, but um, from, I think, a farmer's perspective, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation that was promoted in the last couple of years about the dangers of cannabinoids in the state. Um, and I think is actually, I think it was Senator Rudiman or one of the senators during the hearing said this year, you know, there's really no health crisis around CBDs really anywhere in the country and especially not in Hawaii. So looking at over-regulating um, this industry even more doesn't make sense, especially not for farmers. Um, and controlling it so that farmers can't participate in the value chain will be very difficult. Making it so that we can only sell and process through certain channels um, will not be helpful. So the, um, the legislation that's, that's um, pending right now is to, um, one, make sure we can continue to farm because we're one of the few farm commodities that needs legal approval to keep going. Um, and then also make it legal so we can sell, uh, so we can process and, and sell hemp products whether it's basic oils that have no THC to, to whatever it is, it's, it's not legal. And that's had a profound impact on farmers in the hemp industry, I'd say especially in the last six months, because as word has gotten around the country about how anti-hemp Hawaii is, and a lot of the misinformation that went out um, in the papers and some of the cease and desist orders that were sent by entities on Maui against um, people in, uh, working in the cannabinoid industry, um, payment processors online started drop, dropping hemp farmers and, and um, manufacturers, our largest manufacturer of hemp products in the state, got dropped by a major hotel chain. Um, folks on the mainland, their attorneys were demanding you know, much better um, clarity. If you can buy a hemp product um, and put it in your store, in your hotel or retail place, and you have um, assurances from your attorney that that product has um, completely supported by the state coming out of Oregon or Colorado, what product are you going to carry? Even if you're a retailer in Hawaii, you're going to carry a Colorado product, not a Hawaii product. So it's really critical that we get um, passed in the next few weeks um, legislation that legalizes the, um, the processing, manufacturing, and sale of hemp products, where they have um, a minuscule amount of legal THC in it, less than 0.3% or not. That, that's that's got to happen, or quite frankly, the hemp industry is dead in Hawaii. Um, the the uh, other aspect of that is just um, continuing, uh, allowing us to continue to cultivate. And it looks like because of our um, uh, 
uh, finances in the state, obviously, that a lot of states are facing with the COVID epidemic, you know, we cannot, uh, there's actually reductions at the Department of Agriculture, many agencies, and they understand that. So they're looking to place all of us farmers under a federal growing program, which in many ways will open up this state to, um, uh, it's a very easy program to um, manage the paperwork under, and anyone from anywhere can now apply to grow hemp um, in Hawaii and have minimal ties to Hawaii. So we've gone from being the most restrictive program to grow hemp in the country to open field with almost no restrictions. So, so those of us from the farming industry that have put our <laughs> life's work and experience on the line to try to further sustainability, um, great access to uh, a plant that's a food and, and um, that people use for um, uh, promoting their health, the cannabinoid aspects of stuff, to be in very, um, uh, you know, open field day. It's gonna be very difficult for farmers to, in Hawaii to continue to farm um, under USDA, but um, we've been in contact with USDA and they might be able to put some restrictions in place that will help um, Hawaii farmers. So it, it's been a little bit of a crazy ride. Um, we're grateful for um, senators and representatives like Senator Rubinerman, Senator Gabbard, Representative Cregan, they've been tremendous advocates for a long time for him. I mean, we wouldn't have the program if there weren't for um, folks like that, for sure. Um, I, I would like to say that we've also had a lot of help um, this last year from a wonderful gentleman on the mainland named uh, Mr. Bo Whitney. He's a leading hemp economist, and he has um, written a couple of white papers uh, um, when, when we've asked him to, to, to look at some of the bills and his um, offered advice on how to structure the Hawaii hemp industry so it really serves Hawaii communities and Hawaii farmers in particular, because we know if we can keep the farmers viable, we keep our ag communities viable, the money circulates. And um, so th those white papers have been circulating a little bit in the legislature. And he um, has said that the value of the Hawaii hemp industry, just on the farming and biomass aspects, can be as much as 100 million in this, this state. And um, a lot of people feel that's very conservative. And if you look at the hemp product side and the value added side of things, it, it's much higher than that. And so, um, you know, the, in Oregon last year, the farm, the hemp crop was worth 1 billion. And that's just the raw um, uh, product, uh, the raw plant itself. And then you look at making um, products out of that, uh, you know, the whole spectrum, including cannabinoids, and um, you're bringing a lot more into the state. So even though we're, you know, we're in very difficult economic times, I think hemp is going to play a very important role, or can be if we get some uh, minimal supports. And one of those things we're really hoping the legislature will look at and in including in um, one of the the one bill that's surviving on hemp right now, which is 1819, HB 1819, is um, a la labeling, which will require 100% Hawaii-grown hemp in Hawaii hemp products. Um, if we don't do that, if we allow some kind of blending like we've allowed for Kona coffee or, um, or other Hawaii-grown products, we'll be losing, I think um, Mr. Whitney estimated, if we just allow blending at 51%, we'll be losing um, uh, a minimum of $7 million per year. And over three years, about $70 million will be going out of the state because manufacturers, it's cheaper for them to import hemp oils or cannabinoids from China, which aren't necessarily safe, you know, <laughs> have gone through the same screens versus Hawaii. So it's actually a public safety issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. To look at some of these labeling requirements as, as, as well as supporting Hawaii farmers because we have the highest um, capitalization and farming costs in the country. I think the other thing to consider with regard to the labeling is the fact that um, all the Hawaii hemp farmers that I know use regenerative practices. They're organic, and I wish I could show a picture of our farm right now. Um, but, it, you know, we, we have a foot of mulch, and we build soil, and we're polycropping food in with our hemp. You know, we provided 50 boxes of food off of our last hemp crop. So, um, so farming in, in Hawaii is unique. Um, our hemp farmers are unique. I think we want to support them. And so I think if we can somehow um, help our, our legislature keep HB 1819 alive, which will legalize, we're hoping it includes measures to legalize the sale of um, 
hemp and also allow us to continue to farm. But also the labeling issue is probably the most important thing that we can get in there for Hawaii farmers, 100% requirement this year. Um, and Mr. Whitney pointed that out as probably the most single, most important thing to support Hawaii farmers and um, uh, uh, the, hemp, the hemp industry in Hawaii. Um, gosh, I feel like I've taken a lot of time here. So Greg, do you want to jump in at all? Or Brent, are there any questions? I could go on and on about hemp, obviously. <laughs> no, this is fantastic. Uh, you know, the, our communities, uh, you know, we're dealing with the same plant. Uh, but our communities don't often have that cross fertilization of ideas that come out of this type of discussion. So I think it's incredibly helpful. And, you know, I always like to point out this one very simple example of the, the reason we need to legalize hemp right now. And, and that's just for every home that has chickens, right? Hemp is this incredible source of of chicken feed as well and and nutrition for for kids and and anyone that you know that's eating hemp but if for no other reason in the world but to eat healthier eggs that's true very dark orange beautiful <laughs> right <laughs> so anyway that's my little uh little take on that and, and uh thank you so much and thanks for teaming up with greg here and uh Greg, thank you for being here. You bet. Um, yeah, I just want to say from somebody who spent the last four years growing this plant and have been working on genetic development and getting seed strains brought in from the mainland and developing strains here, um, you know, we're in the same boat. We're basically growing the same plant as, uh, as uh, THC cannabis plants. I mean, it, we're trying to grow feminized seed and plants so there's no uh, pollination. We're trying to grow the highest quality CBD strains possible with the best THC, I mean the best uh, terpene profiles. And what we bring to the table is the ability to have a quality uh, hemp growing operation. Quality is what Hawaii will be all about. It won't be quantity. We're not going to be able to compete against Canada. We're not going to be able to compete against Kentucky. But we do have a brand that people really want because they believe in the Hawaiian quality, 100% Hawaiian. And um, that is our opportunity. That's our niche that's going to make the difference for the hemp farmers here in Hawaii. You know, Brent, may I jump in real quick? There's one other thing I wanted to just um, offer in terms of context. I know that um, farmers like uh, Greg and my husband who worked so hard to get the initial um, hemp legislation passed, and actually for, for decades, um, one of the aspects, especially when we were drafting white papers, and I think starting 2013, 2014, we were really looking at how um, hemp can support food security in this state, not just because it is a great food, but because, um, because of the recent boom in, in um, cannabinoids and interest in those, it's, it's a high value crop. And so, you know, as we know, our farmers here, especially the small family farmers and the organic farmers, subsidize food production here with spouses' jobs or some of their income. So if you can grow a, a hemp product for, for cannabinoids, you know, once a year, every couple of years, you've provided some financial security to your, foods, your food operations. And you've actually made farming a little bit more attractive to these younger farmers who are going, why would I jump into farming in Hawaii? I mean, we're lucky that we have a young farmers movement here in Hawaii because it's so expensive. The access to land, the access to capital is very, very difficult. So when my husband and these farmers were banging their heads trying to get this legislation passed, you know, I guess about six, seven years ago, they really looked at this because it, CBDs weren't that big a deal, but they were beginning to be. And we know it's just going to continue to be a nice market. It should remain an accessible market. We should be able to get it at a grocery store. You know, I mean, we get Noni, we get Olena. This is a plant-based food. There is no health crisis, you know, and farmers deal with public safety three times a day. So um, it does not need to be overregulated. In fact, the legislation that we've proposed would require anyone who's doing any kind of hemp product to do third-party testing, you know, certain restrictions on labeling. We want to protect the public health. We do that all the time.
But the bottom line is really hemp is tied into sustainability and also to food security in this state. So I think it's really critical that, uh, I don't know that we've gotten that message through to the legislature. I know Senator Ruderman gets it, <laughs> but I'm not sure everyone else does in terms of one, the value, how much money we could bring in in terms of taxes and GET if we truly support the hemp farmer. You know, if we're just supporting the processors and the manufacturers, you know, they don't have to buy Hawaii grown hemp. That money can go out of state. But if we start at the bottom and we, and we support the foundation, which is our ag communities, our ag farmer, it can tremendously shift things here in Hawaii, not just sustainability, food security, and agriculture. Thanks for letting me jump back in. That's right. And, and really uh, an indication of the availability of hemp farming to society is an indication not only of health, but of farming in general. And I think it's a big turnoff, as you're saying, especially to um, anyone that wants to get involved in farming. Um, they just can't understand why hemp would be illegal. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> And uh, thank you, Greg. I uh, really appreciate the three of you. you. You've been responsible for all of the progress uh, in the area of hemp farming. And it's such a pleasure and a, a real treat to have you uh, here today. Thank you uh, for helping us celebrate medical death. Um, up next, uh, we have cannabis nurse Wendy. Aloha, Wendy. Um, Cannabis nurse Wendy has been uh, involved in a lot of our events, and of course, she's seen a lot of patients and has worked with a lot of people that have really been in need. And I'm just so grateful all the time for, uh, for your willingness to, to jump on board and, and say, uh, share your manalo for patients. So, thank you for being here, uh, Wendy Gibson. Thank you, Brent, for making this possible, and I want to thank you. Happy Medical Cannabis Day to everybody, and don't, don't forget to get your shirt, <laughs> if you can, if you can get one. A uh, special thank you, well, everybody, for being here. I'm seeing lots of faces I know that, that I've worked with, and um, thanks for helping celebrate this special day, and special thanks to Dr. Otto for making it all happen and helping bring to light the legitimate use of medical cannabis and especially for his advocacy for patients and helping educate all of us about the unintended consequences of the laws, um, not just to patients, but to our entire dispensary program. I've been a medical cannabis nurse for about six years. and I've been working with the Drug Policy Forum and Medical Cannabis Coalition of Hawaii for about six years. You can see um, well, lot, lots of changes in our medical, in, well, in our drug laws, although most times it feels like it's happening at a glacial pace, but um, I'm hopeful that going forward, we can maybe make some bigger changes a little bit quicker. And also thanks to Dr. Otto helping set the, the groundwork for that um, by notifying the Attorney General that, that um, these things need to, to come to light and be examined uh, in much more depth. Um, I've worked with drug policy, with the Drug Policy Forum and Medical Cannabis Coalition. I got to sit on a couple of task forces. One of them was a task force that helped shape the legislation that became the dispensary bill. And it's, it's not the bill, it's not, they didn't take all of our recommendations, I'll, I'll say that. Um, and we've, we've had to work hard at trying to uh, correct some of the, the faults that we, we see in, in the dispensary program. Um, but COVID, when COVID came along and killed a bunch of legislation that was in motion, it really killed a lot of important bills. Um, there were some that, were, that would help to um, regulate CBD products and hemp products. There were some that were, would allow um, insurance companies to pay for patients' medicines. There was also bills in motion that would have allowed dispensaries to offer edibles and delivery services, and also that provided employee protections. And I've seen 
a lot of patients harmed from more from the drug laws than the medicine, you know, from cannabis or any drugs actually. The, the drug laws seem to be what cause more harm than the actual drugs. I've seen firsthand how cannabis can help patients recover from injuries and illness and, and thrive where and these are patients who have been failed by allopathic medicine and, and prescription medications. I've also seen refugee families that came to Hawaii because the state where they lived didn't have a medical cannabis program. And many of these patients live in, in, in fear of being recognized. Um, so we, we really have a long ways to go in changing our drug laws so that and not, not just in Hawaii, but nationwide, so that, so that our patients are no longer being harmed. <laughs> what a cutie. Hi. Um, but I'm, I, I've seen a lot of harm to patients, um, and, and really I'm, ho I'm hopeful that we can make some good changes, and I'm, I'm really grateful for all of you for being there for over these years being part of helping make these changes and, and maybe hopefully helping revive some of the legislation that was killed. Um, I, I think that this also highlights a need to, to legalize not just cannabis, but all drugs, and also to help educate people. I'm hoping that this will be a time where people will start seeing the connections between racism and drug policy because you, you asked the question yourself, Britt, you know, why did hemp become illegal in the first place? Well, both cannabis sativas became illegal pretty much back in 1937 with the Marijuana Stamp Tax Act and it was solely based on racism. So if we can help people make these connections and understand why, how our drug laws, including the Controlled Substance Act and Richard's, Nick, Richard Nixon's hatred for anti-war protesters and Negroes. So, you know, we can, we can, I think we can maybe get people more interested in drug law and, and show and, and, and have a better audience for, for our issues, for patient issues. So I am hopeful that going forward that, um, you know, what's happening now with Black Lives Matter, I think is helping, it is more helpful for, for us at, at this moment in time. And so um, I also wanna echo Cynthia Thielen's, um, I think she's the one who, who, I don't know if she created this or not, but it was hemp, hemp, hooray. And, and I think that that's, that hemp, Farming is going to be really essential to helping people get the better medicines. Um, I am I am definitely concerned about the um, the oversale of CBD products, and but but I, I think that'll all get worked out eventually too, as we can help educate patients about drug drug interactions and about how to safely use all of the medicines. And as an American Cannabis Nurse Association nurse, I am I'm very invested in promoting excellence in cannabis nursing and helping patients have access to their medicines, helping them understand how to use their medicines, how to grow their medicines, how to, um, how to just safely label them and, and all of that. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to working more with all of you going forward in, in a, trying to achieve those, some of those goals, just to try to help educate, motivate, and activate people to take action so that we can get better access for, for patients all across, but everywhere. <laughs> so. As you have been doing for so long, Wendy, thank you so much for your efforts. Um, it, your, your efforts have uh, really reached a lot of people, you know. Uh, I, it, feel, so it doesn't feel like I've been doing much lately, but I'm hoping to get back in action um, soon. 
Well, all your work with the Drug Policy Forum, oh. so foundational. Um, and oh, is that your updated yeah. guidelines? Is it not showing? Can I get it here? There we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the process of revising our guidebook for medical professionals and patients about Hawaii's drug laws regarding medical cannabis. So if anybody wants to give me input on that, this is available online at the Drug Policy Forum's website, dpfhi.org. And it's, it's, it's in rough shape right now, I have to warn you. But if you'd like to have any input on it, it's sort of a history of drug laws in Hawaii and how they've been changing and um, what the Department of Health's rules are as far as things like labeling your plants and about the gun laws, um, the, patient, the registration process and that. So we're trying, it, it, it's, we're gonna stop publishing it, the hard copies, but we're, it's just gonna go to an all online. But if you have any input you'd like to give me, I'm, I would love to have it from you. And you can connect with me um, through our Facebook page, Medical Cannabis Coalition or Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii, uh, or on uh, Twitter, Drug Policy Forums, Twitter, or email. You can email me at organizer, or, oh well, how about this one? Can cannabis, <laughs> that's easier to spell. Cannabis at dpfhi.org. Do you have any suggestions? I'm open. Thank you, and I'm just publishing that uh, to everyone in the in the meeting. If you'll open up your chat window, you can get that email address that uh, Wendy just mentioned. And, okay, thank you. Matt. Yeah, thank you so much. And you know, one one thing that is uh, really coming out of this meeting for me is just this this uh, different perspectives and and really. You know, we, we just have the most outstanding cannabis community in our state. We may, we may not be on the same islands. We may have different interests. We may actually at times have conflicting interests as we specialize into different areas of cannabis. You know, we know that the cannabis and hemp industries are so large that we we have to specialize and as we move towards uh, monetization, as we move towards legalization, or simply finding the laws that are appropriate for medical cannabis in Hawaii, it's important to, to do this exercise, right? Where we come together and we focus strictly on, on, on patient needs. And it's the one common denominator we still share in Hawaii, I think, um, that makes Hawaii and our, our medical cannabis law so special and especially, you know, here today on our 20th anniversary of Medical Cannabis Day. So, so thank you. Um, and, and thank you so much, Cannabis Nurse Wendy, for thank sharing you. with you, Renato. And um, so up next, uh, we have a couple of cannabis thought leaders. Uh, I think I've mentioned uh, every time I've talked publicly about cannabis that the only reason I'm in this conversation at all um, is from early discussions and I managed to climb up on the shoulders of some giants in our community. <coughs> uh, of course, Roger Christie being one of those, Mike Ruggles being another who have lent me the perspectives, uh, the awareness to actually uh, see the need and to move forward. So. Um, I know we have Roger on the line here. Roger, are you, uh, do you have a video feed that you can uh, open up? Hey, good morning. Aloha, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. My pleasure. Thank you for putting this on. Everybody I've seen so far here has played a beautiful role in, in this incredible, amazing, and healthful effort to get health care to people that deserve it. Of course, medical marijuana is such a crucial thing. It became the kind of the top of the pyramid, the first thing that that was uh, that the hearts opened for uh, compassion to get uh, get people that were suffering at the moment the medicine that they needed. Um, it's been my pleasure to be part of the effort. It's just a natural evolution for me to to evolve to the spiritual use of cannabis and cannabis as preventative medicine. Of course, once 
you know, you have medical marijuana, you qualify for medical marijuana, you're already sick and in pain. And this plant is such an obviously obvious helper for prevention that that must be included in, you know, in the mix here going forward. Um, think about back in the day when uh, it was pretty lonely um, trying to get medical marijuana going. Even that phrase medical marijuana was, was relatively new back in the 1990s. Um, I found one of my archives. I wish I could show it to you, but I'll describe it. Uh, George Zimmer <clears throat> was very kind. He's a part-time resident of the Big Island, and uh, he was kind enough to give me a, a $15,000 grant to get a public opinion poll. He said, "What we were going to do an industrial hemp farm at Hamakua Sugar Company back in the day. George was going to fund it, and uh, I was going to run it or be part of it, and then." And it was all going, and he's a multi-billionaire, certainly had the, the ability to pay for it. Hamakua Sugar was, I think, for sale at that time, 40,000 deep soil acres. And somebody whispered to me one day, hey, we hear you're, doing, you know, you're planting an industrial hemp farm on the Hamakua coast. I got one word. It's going to sink that canoe really fast, and it's pollen. And we didn't know what to do with that word at that time and certainly didn't want to destroy anybody's crops in the trade winds in any way, shape, or form. So we stopped that particular effort, George and I. I had a, a letter, by the way, from the mayor, Yamashiro, at the time to the DEA for allowing a special permit for that farm. And I had a letter that from a company in Oregon wanted to buy 20,000 tons of hemp stock per month to make hemp particle board. Anyway, we stopped that project. George says, what else can we do to in, increase life and goodness on the Big Island? I said, since we don't have the right to vote here, which is unbelievable for state initiative, let's buy the public opinion. So he gave me a, a, uh, a check and we hired a company in Sacramento to do a public opinion poll in 1998. And it's very scientific, and it's a beautiful thing, and it, I have it in my hand. It says, uh, there have been a lot of talk about marijuana being used for medical purposes. Do you support or oppose the use of marijuana for medical purposes? 63% of the respondents said they strongly or somewhat supported legalized medical marijuana. This came in about a month before the election of Gov Governor Cayetano. He was going for re-election against Linda Lingle. And they were about tied, as I recall, back at that time. And I thought, wow, if either one of these candidates held up this public opinion poll, that could swing the election their way. Boom. And so we just gave this survey to each of those uh, campaigns. Neither one used it, which was interesting. Um, but a few days after the election, Governor Cayetano came out strongly for medical marijuana and helped drive it through the legislature, which we're certainly glad he did. So that was fun to remember. Um, I evolved to the spiritual use, which I believe it's such a beautiful concept that everybody's heard of, the separation of church and state. That's, I want to breathe new life into that. That's kind of an old sounding term, but it really has a beautiful future. And I experienced uh, just about 10 years of the Hawaii Cannabis THC ministry. And we had the benefit, we enjoyed the benefit of separation of church and state. I was told by everybody in law enforcement from Ed Kubo, the US attorney, to the DEA agent in Hilo, Jesse Formey, to Billy Kanoi, Mitch Roth, everybody else, that we had a form of immunity from prosecution as long as we kept our activities private and then some other things got in the way, you know, the Peaceful Sky Initiative, and I went after the former police chief for violating his oath of office, a couple other things. And I think some pride went before my fall and the THC ministry was shut down and we were arrested. But going forward, this is the year 2020, I just found an archi in my archive a federal injunction that I filed in 2004 a complaint for declaratory relief and permanent injunction against the government. And uh, we filed it and then had my lawyer had such bad manners. I had to fire him back in the day. And he wrapped this case up and said, hey, anytime in the future you want to reopen this injunction, 
it'd be fairly easy to do. Just add some new exhibits and a couple of edits and you could refile it. So that's what I want to do. And one of the great gifts that we got from fi that I got from filing this case was that the US government, you know, when you sue somebody, they have 30 days to respond and a motion to dismiss. And the federal government threw the kitchen sink at me and everything else they could think of in a 37 page motion to dismiss. Well, I have their motion to dismiss in my hand, okay? So when I refile this or we refile this going forward, we have most of the government's chess moves in advance going into the case. So that's what I think is, is my role and our role at the THC ministry going forward to help people the most. Um, certainly in the last 20 years, we found that cannabis is an essential ingredient in the holy anointing oil of Moses and the christening oil of Jesus which is still relatively unknown to most people. It's called Cana Bosem in Hebrew. And it's in every single Bible. In English, they call it fragrant cane or sweet cane. They misname it so people can't really have it and be anointed properly. Of course, the word Christ means anointed. Christian means an anointed one. Most people think it's a symbolic thing. I'm convinced it's a literal thing. I made this little two-line poem. We believe anointing is a literal thing. Anoint your crown with holy oil and hear the angels sing. I think it's something that goes into the crown chakra and changes someone, feeds their, their endocannabinoid system, creates this, a level of homeostasis, which increases their humanity, their conscious awareness, and their happiness and holiness going forward. So I think that's part of the future. Am I going too fast or talking too much? You're doing great, Roger. Thank you. Okay. So, and then just last month, please look it up if you haven't seen it. Proof positive, two different universities in Israel examined the tracings of an altar from ancient days, 2,700 years ago that was found back in the 1960s. Scientific analysis proved that cannabis and frankincense were burned on the altar in the Holy of Holies in Israel. And these two altars are about three feet apart. So to enter the Holy of Holies and communi communicate with God, one had to inhale burning cannabis and burning frankincense. Whew. And we're in a Judeo-Christian legal system and to me, this rings the bell. It, it is, it's, it's just such complete scientific work. It's very believable when, when you investigate it. Please just Google search it easily and see that this is the case. And so it's a beautiful thing. The anointing and, and the burning of the incense is a very religious, provable thing. It does something very special for the humans that get to access it and make us more whole and com complete as human beings. So my wife and I have, you know, we took a licking from the, from the, the government, that's for sure, and denied bail, denied a trial, denied sunshine, denied outdoors for many years. And my wife, Cher, is still on probation right now. And, uh, but anyway, we have life force and energy and intention and prayerfulness to go forward and complete this journey of the federal government recognizing and then protecting the First Amendment religious and spiritual use of cannabis for we the people. And to me, that's a very worthy goal and a beautiful future ahead of us. Well, thank you for that, Roger, and happy Medical Cannabis Day to you. That, that was fantastic. And, and please give our love to share. Uh, uh, we understand that uh, she's still uh, she's still dealing with uh, legal consequences of uh, of what whatever we have. Yeah, she's been denied. Her, she's been denied early release from pro, from probation as in January, which is unbelievable. With the strong support of the probation department to let her go. And we just filed the pro se motion a month ago to see if Judge Kobayashi would allow it now. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll switch over now, check in with um, local grower, breeder. I'm not sure if we have uh, any others, but uh, Andrew Simmons is with us from uh, formerly uh, Puna Grower Supply. And maybe you can pick up the story from there, Andrew, and just share a few words about um, uh, Medical Cannabis Day and, and, and what you guys are doing to celebrate. The floor is yours. Okay, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Check, check. Okay, so happy Medical Cannabis Day, everyone. Uh, like Brent said, my name is Andrew Simmons. I, uh, cannabis has been a part of my life for over half of my life now. Um, been fighting for, you know, medical rights, but more or less just plant rights, just rights to our natural, you know, when you're born, you're born with certain unalienable rights, natural rights. Um, so I feel no different about my friend here, the cannabis plant. Then I do the tomato plants that are, I'm not gonna show you, but they're about 10 feet beside me here. I have just as much right to grow this one as I do the tomato plants. And to me, there really is no difference. And it really doesn't matter if it's because I enjoy the way this plant looks. It produces beautiful flowers. It may uh, be a medical benefit to me. It may just be because I want to grow it because I have the right to, um, but I do hold that right to grow this plant. And so I have a big problem with any government restricting or limiting my ability to grow this plant. It does happen to be my medicine and I am able to caretake and provide for other patients this medicine. And so, this plant is more important to me than the tomato plant. That's just my personal feelings. As far as equal under the law, they should be treated no different. I understand our government has the right to restrict commerce and regulate commerce, and, and I'm in agreement with that. If, if I'm gonna take this product here and sell it to the public, there should be some sort of oversight and regulations. Maybe they shouldn't be as, uh, overly regulated and restrictive and taxed as it is, um, I feel like, you know, it is unfair the way this, trans this plant is treated in comparison to other commodities around the world, but it is what it is for now. We are definitely in a time of transition and, uh, you know, mostly positive things ha happening in the cannabis community across the country, it seems, uh, but we are still fighting battles and, you know, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe our state is going to try to take away caregiving rights or caretaking rights in 2023. Is that still the case? You want me to oh, respond? I need to to case. Uh, yeah, I think if someone knows, for sure, yes, I believe it is still the case, but I, I actually don't want you to quote me on that because I'm not certain. If someone else does know, please at least let us know. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Andrew. Can you comment on that? I, yeah, let me unmute. Please, please Brent, go ahead. Do you have something you wanted to say? Well, I just had oh. it in my calendar, uh, and it's in my calendar right now that the caregiving program was sunsetted, uh, but I don't know if that's a fact or not. Well, the, the provision that, Wendy, you're muted. I don't, I don't know if you know that you're muted. Um, but I was going to say that as of 2023, there is a provision that I've seen that would eliminate, uh, it would actually restrict the number of patients who could co or number, yeah, number of patients who could co-locate their plants to five. That was put in a couple of years ago. That's the only restriction that I'm aware of. There, there may be others. And, uh, and that's something that needs to change in the next couple of years along with, I feel, what should be a formal, formal protection of the right to create private collectives as a way to make sure that patients are getting safe access. Yeah. Say it louder for the people in the back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and also part of that does apply to caregivers as growers. So they were gonna sunset the, the ability of a caregiver to grow for a patient, but only 
under certain circumstances. Um, there, there's exemptions for parents. There's exemptions for patients who don't live within, I think, 25 miles of a dispensary, that type of thing. But they were, they, the, the thinking was that now that we have dispensaries, patients don't need a caregiver to grow it for them. But, and, and it was originally due to um, expire or whatever in 2018, but we got it extended to 2023. And so, you know, there's, and we'll, we'll probably argue it again in 2023. Yeah, I'll help you argue that. <laughs> we yeah. certainly need caregivers, you know, I'm all for dis the dispensaries being there. Um, people do need uh, convenient access to medicine and you know as, as much as we try as caregivers we do have weather factors and different things that can cause our supply to not meet the demand of our patients at times and um, so nothing against the dispensaries they have every right to provide medicine to patients um, but we definitely have a lot of folks that just could not afford to buy their medicine at the dispensary and uh you know as a caregiver it's it's a blessing to be able to grow something in my yard that can bring you know some relief to someone else and, and in some cases can save people's lives yeah. so the, to take my yeah. right away to help someone else by being a farmer and growing a natural cure in my backyard is uh is not going to sit very well with me nor any other patients across the state, especially if, if you are a grower and caretaker, you, you've seen what this plant can do for yourself and, and others, and it'd be a shame to take that away. Yeah, I agree. Right, and I think one of the threats right now to patients uh, is, is that they may be getting their, their medicine from neighbors, uh, and those neighbors, uh, like Andrew, you know, I, I grow also, uh, may be supplying more than uh, four patients, including ourselves. And in some cases, you know, we're legally growing hundreds of plants, not just uh, 50 plants. And so if we're not careful about the bills that we introduce, um, if we're not uh, careful about preserving our rights, as Andrew said, um, we could find patients that uh, can no longer uh, afford medicine and um, could could create a health crisis uh, similar to what we experienced five years ago when the um, alternative pain management clinic was shut down with nearly 200 patients sent out into the street to buy their their cannabis. So we're we're hoping to avoid that is is what I'm hearing um, and what I'm feeling as well. Uh, and we, we certainly don't want any abrupt transitions to anyone's safe, affordable medical supplies. So mm -hmm. um, thanks for bringing that up, Andrew. And, uh, I'll, I'll jump out. I'll jump back out for now. Um, yeah, um, you know, I didn't come prepared today to like have any s certain sort of things that I wanted to be said. Just figure I'd kind of free flow it and I chat with you guys. Um, I did miss a uh, majority of the chat so far today. I think I've been on for probably 10 minutes previous to, to my, um, my talk here. So I hope I'm not going to be repeating stuff that other people have said, but if I do, I guess maybe it's, it's worth repeating. Um, but we certainly have to stand up for patients. We can't let patients get left behind. We can't have people suffering, um, especially when we can grow a cure or a treatment or relief in our own backyards. Some people are too sick to, to grow their own or possibly, you know, a couple of our patients actually just live in a place where it's so wet and they just, they tried to grow, but they weren't able to take stuff to the finish line. They were getting a lot of mold and different things. So in some people's cases, it's, may even just be where they live. It's just too wet or, you know, they don't have, uh, obviously <laughs> being the city in lower Puno, we have uh, a lot of people living off grid, which uh, makes it even tougher to grow good medicine because you might pull off the perfect crop, 
great weather, everything, but a lot of people don't have the means to dry it here properly. So uh, one thing that we need to work on also, I think, is uh, educating patients that are able to grow for themselves how to do so without potentially harming themselves. Um, I do believe the some of the mold and bacterial factors are overplayed by our government it's just because people have been smoking cannabis for the beginning of time, like Roger was speaking about earlier, even since the Bible days, people were, people were at least using cannabis, whether they were smoking it or using it as incense to inhale it. People have had a relationship with this plant for a long time and it doesn't take much thinking to realize that we were supposed to find this plant. We were supposed to utilize this plant. It's a beautiful flower. If you don't come across it and see it, just smelling it is going to want you to track down and find whatever you're smelling. And then you're going to see a beautiful flower. Then you're going to realize, hey, there's something to this thing. What is this? Man was supposed to find and use cannabis is what I'm getting at. And, uh, and uh, we certainly have over time found the many uses that it can be beyond just medical um, we can you know basically build anything we want today out of cannabis and i hope when i die that a good majority of all petroleum based plastic is replaced with cannabis based you know biodegradable plastics or more durable plastics um and beyond just plastic obviously cool and uh, Possibilities are so close. I mean, you guys are preaching to the choir there, but you guys know how valuable cannabis is and what it could do to help, you know, heal some of the damage we've done to our environment. And, uh, uh, so beyond the medical use, we should certainly be using it for all the other uh, industrial purposes. Um, and uh, one thing I just thought of by saying that is what Roger touched on earlier when he was talking about his hemp farm and uh, not ending up going forward with it because someone had brought to his attention pollen and uh i just want to elaborate on it i'm not going to tell anyone they're wrong for growing hemp here in hawaii because you know if it's, if, if it's allowed then certainly i feel i don't blame anyone for doing it but i do want to just touch on that pollen issue again uh, you know i want to see hemp grow on everywhere around the world what i do not want to see is, is Cannabis that we know today, medical cannabis, THC rich varieties, uh, tarnished or destroyed because of hemp. Uh, so I'm all for hemp, but we need to definitely be mindful of where it's grown. Uh, should it be grown from clone only females here in Hawaii? Uh, the reason it's so important here in Hawaii, I feel, is we are in a unique position to save pure THC rich variety cannabis. Let's just say, for instance, on the mainland, there's going to be, especially going forward in the future, a lot more grows popping up, whether it's medical cannabis, recreational cannabis, or hemp. There's going to be, there's a lot now, but it's going to keep growing. But here in Hawaii, being that we are so isolated out in the middle of the ocean, if, if we were to at least be careful about how we grew hemp to restrict pollen drift as much as we possibly could, uh, we might look back 50 years from now and say glad we did because we might be the only place that could truly preserve natural, I shouldn't say natural, but preserve what we know as cannabis now, which is natural. But um, I, I'm just scared that if, if, if hemp fields were to pop up everywhere and there were male and female plants planted, um, I, I breed with cannabis and, and I know what pollen drift can cause even in my own projects. Uh, just by having a male that I didn't intend on pollinating another female, what that can cause. Now I'm all of a sudden, I don't know what genetics are in this flower and I pretty much have to discard them. I don't have to, but I, they're of no use to me anymore because I, it's questionable what they are. And when we're talking about hemp pollen, uh, you know, if I grew those out expecting for my patients to receive the same effects that they always got from that strain, they're not going to get those same effects. Uh, that's going to be a totally different genetic makeup at that point. And so I'm all for hemp. I will scream it as loud as possible that, you know, hemp should be grown everywhere. But we need to be very mindful here in Hawaii of where it's grown, 
how it's grown, and just know that we're in a unique position to save and preserve cannabis that is THC rich variety and medical to many people. Uh, great, great. Anybody cool. want to ask a question or add to what I just said? Yeah, yeah thank I, you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, some of our hemp farmers uh, respond and um, thank you so much, Andrew. You're, you're perspective is super appreciated as are everyone's perspective and and uh you you're you're our last scheduled guest for today so i'm gonna sort of open up and unmute everyone's microphones um first uh i'd like to invite gail and cab to sort of address some of the zoning regulations that might be proposed or have been proposed in other states or or how we can mitigate some of those risks that you just brought up um and then i'd like to bring in uh will collins uh who everyone knows uh, has been so helpful in putting our events together uh for so many years and uh, will always has a perspective that is really complementary to uh uh, unity and bringing everyone uh, onto the same page. So, so we'll do that. And um, thank you again, Andrew. 110% appreciate you and, you and what you're doing. And also, um, I hope it's okay if I mention this. We we saw it in our 420 virtual event and the dispensary tour, but um, we saw some of your flowers uh, on that dispensary tour over at Big Island Grown. Did you want to? comment on that and maybe let us know where that might be going well, I, I can't say for certain that you like that patients will be able to buy um those flowers on the shelf um, my understanding currently is that they are they do a couple test runs to make sure that it 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 just fits into their program uh so they they ran it at least once when they cracked the initial seeds um and then they they pheno hunted and picked the strain that they wanted to do a test run with further and i believe they filled up a couple of tables with that in particular and they'll probably you know take notes of uh yield and the thc levels and i'm sure there's many factors that go into determining what makes it on the shelf and, and what doesn't but uh i'm hopeful that patients will be able to eventually go to the dispensaries and be able to purchase some of the stuff that I've uh, created here locally. Uh, you know, I kind of gear my breeding towards outdoor um, hardiness resistance for uh, local growers, uh, but it, it, you know, it's going to do well inside also. And uh, I can't say what they'll do with them, but I gave them a bunch of seeds to um, hunt through and I know they're hunting to at least one or two other strains right now. So, um, it's possible you'll see some matchmaker genetics available um, through Big Island Grown, and uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm happy to see it. It's um, it's fun for me, and it's a passion that I enjoy, uh, and I hope to share it with everyone in August, September when I do my initial public releases. So uh, thanks for asking about that, and um, I'm, I'm hopeful that you guys will be able to try some of the stuff I've been playing with in the dispensary soon right on thank you andrew happy medical cannabis day yes you, you guys too <laughs> and and so again we'll, we'll just um we'll, we'll go back and and see if we have some uh ways to mitigate those those risks that you mentioned um and also we'll we'll be sort of um uh, at noon right we're going to take another break and we're going to officially end uh the event for today but it doesn't mean that we're going to end the discussion or the conversation so um you can you know we're going to open it up for everyone and as we unmute our microphones as um i just like for everyone to be mindful um if you are making um if you're moving anything or if you've got uh, anything going on with your microphones unmuted uh, could get really noisy really fast. So if everyone could just be mindful of that as we open up the discussion at 12 o'clock, that would be awesome and appreciated. 
And again, thank you. And, and thank you, Dr. Otto, for the introduction uh, for Medical Cannabis Day and helping us really understand uh, what we're doing here and, and where we're at and where we need to go. So thank you so much for that. And thanks for everyone that signed up early to become a uh, guest on the show and to um, share your manaho. So, so thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And um, with that, um, let's go back you, over to uh, Gail and Cab. Uh, you're on. Yeah, thanks. Great discussion and just wanted to follow up what um, folks probably don't know if they haven't applied for a hemp permit is you have to, um, well, they're pretty lengthy. And one of the things you have to talk about and um, demonstrate is how you're gonna implement best management practices to minimize pollen drift. And have you been in contact with folks in your area that may have legal grows? So we, um, that's part of the conversations we have legally uh, that we're required to have, and that's what we do right now um, to, to mitigate any potential. We haven't had those issues where we are, but did you, I know Clarence has had extensive experience. He's consulted on the mainland on hemp grows and in Canada, and he can talk about some of the ways that they're handling things there. They don't know what's going on in the mainland doesn't necessarily transfer over here because we have, you know, different landscape and different needs, but um, you want to talk about that? Yeah, first of all, uh, big ups, Andrew, um, identifying that that is a real concern. And uh, your concern is my concern on steroids because I have a possibly larger field that I'm going to be growing and my genetics are valuable to me as much as your genetics are valuable to you. And uh, we don't want to see any kind of cross-pollination from my neighbor's low-grade hemp crop uh, into my high-grade medicinal crop. So we definitely need to look at um, areas that uh, fields are grown with just hemp and, and there's pollen and that's fine. It grows out to the, blows out to the ocean or something and other places need to be, you know, restricted so that we are all on feminized seed or cuttings or something of that nature, which they've already done in, in Colorado, for example, where you have a whole neighborhood, whole county, which is just saying we're going to grow uh, seed. Another county says we're just going to grow fiber. Another county says we're growing medicine. So in that respect, you know, it's going to be helpful. And just the general rule of thumb is that we are on an island. We're all in the same canoe. If it's not good for you, it's not going to be good for me. So we need to make it in that as clear understanding that we're all working this together. And, you know, as, as good as we can make our best seed is how, how we are going to be the best people on this land. So it's very important that I keep uh, true to my genetics and that I'm working on just like you're working on your genetics. And uh, we need to respect and, and be aware of that highly. And uh, something that is a concern if we had large ag just come rolling through here and start you know, mowing down fields with you know, low grade hemp. So that's what we need to uh, be aware of. And I just want to say, yes, it's, it's a fact that we've thought about from day one back when Roger and I were working together and trying to get the hemp fields in the Hamakua. So yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. <laughs> That's fantastic. Can, uh, can I just restate that back and see if, if I, if I heard this correctly, like part of your Manao as a hemp farmer is to check with other neighbors in your area to see if they might also be growing cannabis. Yeah, and the bulk of the folks where we are have indoor greenhouse grows. And one of the things that we were prepared to do was to offer them HEPA filters. If our, first of all, our grow isn't that large yet. Um, and our, you know, it's really easy to get wind trajectory maps, but things change. We know pollen can go where it's not intended to go. Um, so, so I think we have to be prepared to have those kind of conversations. I think this is going to be a very important conversation as we Hawaii hemp farmers are being transitioned to grow under a federal program, not a Hawaii program, because there's no acreage restrictions under the USDA program. There currently are acreage restrictions. We were trying to grow this as a cottage industry, high value, regenerative farming, you know, um, make some good income for small farmers. Um, because of the lack of funds in the state, they're making us now go directly farm under USDA, which means it opens it up. There's none of these restrictions that we've had before. Um, you know, it, 
it's potentially possible, not that it will happen, but some farmer out of Montana, Colorado, or Kentucky can come over here now with no ties to Hawaii, lease some land and grow really big quickly. Um, I think it's a small enough community, like I know all my realtors, I know all my rancher friends and stuff that, you know, before anything like that happened, we'd have opportunity to have some conversations, but, but the reality exists because we're going into USDA now um, for something like that to happen. But currently, that's not what's going on. I mean, Greg can talk to what he's doing too. We're, we're, we're in touch with our neighbors. We know what's going on and, and these guys have tricks up their sleeves too. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I like to say something. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, as somebody who's been really working on genetics, um, I realize I there's I have no desire to grow a male plant unless I'm using it for pollination for a genetic strain. And usually, you just have to grow one stem of male flower to pollinate your your crop to get your genetics and then there's also the feminization process which is not that difficult to do so you can feminize your own plant material and create a only feminized seed that will then create the genetics you want so and that's what you want when you're developing a high cbd strain you don't want male plants so the focus is fairly similar to the cannabis industry. In fact, it's almost exactly. We don't want male plants unless they're used for pollination or, or genetics. So I think most of us who are growing for the, the cannabinoids, the CBG, the CBDs, um, are, are working, are really going to be a problem when it comes to that. It's the big industrial people who will come in and try to grow masses of, of plant material and not caring about males and females. But the, those of us that are kind of been in the beginning of this, we, we're totally agree with you about pollination. We don't want to see that. We, we don't want to be the one that's going to pollinate somebody's medicinal crop uh, and, and cause some kind of grief. That would be the worst thing that we can do as a grower. So we're going to do everything in our power, at least those of us who are farming and, and working on genetics, to make sure that does not happen. So, um, but I do have a question for Jacqueline. Is she still there? I, I don't know if she is or not. But I'm wondering, what is the status uh, on the dispensaries and their ability to sell CBD products and grow CBD flowers um, to uh, within the dispensary movement. We know they tried to pass a bill that was going to make just um, just dispensaries be able to sell CBD, which didn't get passed. So what is the status now? Does anybody know what is happening in the dispensaries when it comes to CBD products? Can they buy my products or do they have to grow their own and sell it in their stores? Does anybody have yeah. Hey, Greg. So that's a great question. I can tell you that we would love nothing more than to be able to procure CBD from somebody like yourself and be able to sell it in the dispensary. What's mm -hmm. happening now is that everything that we, uh, you know, we sell as final product, uh, we have to grow, manufacture, you know, process, manufacture, package the whole deal. I know that there was a couple of dispensaries on Oahu who uh, did, in fact, attempt to, uh, I believe, uh, you know, uh, procure CBD from outside sources to be able to sell it. And I think that was squashed pretty quickly. Um, you know, we are all for it. Um, and in any way we could do that, that would be fantastic for us. I mean, we have to be realistic, not only about the demand, but really about what we are able to do. I mean, we're focusing on, you know, what we're focusing on. And as this, as the community gets more engaged and this opens up, um, we just have to start really hammering down the discussion of how we're going to be working together for a really flourishing, um, not only economy, but, but flourishing, uh, you know, environment for, for people who want to use CBD and THC options. May I ask a question on that topic? Please do. Um, I'm just wondering if there's discussion going on about, because I know that dispensaries can uh, contract out their cultivation. Is that correct? You know, they can contract out 
cult cultivation, yes, you can have outside contractors that come in mm -hmm. and take care of cultivation. Sure. So is there any discussion of the practicalities of allowing a hemp farmer to be one of these crop contractors and supply high quality CBD products directly to the dispensaries? So that's that's really interesting because I this is what I do and this is my firm understanding of the program. So dispensaries or the licenses allow two, uh, you know, production facilities and up to three retail locations. And mm -hmm. so the way I would imagine something like, like that may be able to work. I don't even know. I mean, it would have to be one of the, the, the designated production facilities under the state license. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, it it's interesting. It, this is such a gray area. I don't even, I, it's hard for me to really provide any clarity on it other than I know specifically the infrastructure we have to work with. So we are able to contract out. Um, we have our in-house team that does uh, cultivation. Um, we do have some CBD strains uh, that do ha exceed the 0.3% THC limit, um, but we do have at least two or three strain options uh, for that. So I don't know that I'm answering your question, Cliff, but um, I guess it is feasible. I I'm not sure. If I may, um, it appears that under the current laws that having a um, having become a grow separate from the dispensary to contract to would be a huge cost with all the regulations and it's kind of impractical in my opinion. Uh, hemp farmers to um, in order to make money because we have the highest capitalization and operating costs in the country I mean just farming period Mm -hmm. um, they need, we need to participate in the value chain. We need to be able to process, manufacture, and sell our own value-added products. So I, I, it would be nice to be able to sell a product to the dispensaries, but um, uh, we certainly want to be able to retain that right for ourselves because the money is not, I mean, whether you're growing strawberries <laughs> or hemp, <laughs> as much as you can participate in the value chain as a farmer, um, that's where you're going to make some money. So I, I, um, I think if that were a sales outlet, that'd be fine. But um, we want to make we want to make sure farmers retain the right to participate in the value chain. Sure. Yeah, I think it is really unfortunate that hemp farmers can't provide products to the dispensaries. Um, and I talked to a couple of the dispensary licensees about whether or not they could grow hemp hemp seed and I, I got two different answers one of them told me absolutely not that it's a, a separate product and then I talked to Maui grown therapies and they said they do indeed grow uh, some hemp and so I, I don't really know what the answer is well you know, the could get a hemp license and participate legally under the hemp program I mean I, and that may have been what they've done and I know that I believe that a dispensary on one of them on this island, or at least an associate, has taken out a hemp permit. So they could participate in the hemp program that way. But to grow hemp, you have to have a hemp license right now. You know what? One other thing, too, is that uh, some of the best medicine is 50-50. Uh, so that means the, the CBD and the THC are balanced, say, 15 to 15. That can be grown into dispensary and it can be sold as medicine and you'll be able to have the CBD and the THC together and create the, the medicine you need. So it doesn't have to be, the dispensaries don't have to sell just THC. They could grow a, a cross strain that would be uh, very good medicine. It could be made into you know, topicals. It could be used for all kinds of stuff. So I'm thinking that that's a direction that could easily be done. Excuse me. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Time for a walk. <laughs> so I can tell you that at Big Island Grown, we do, like I was talking about the uh, CBD strains, we also do 
um, one of our strains is a one-to-one. -one. We have a two-to-one and have had a six-to-one at one time, the ratio CBD to THC. Um, so it's definitely an area we should explore. But yes, my understanding is in order to, uh, you know, be able to grow those, uh, those, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, from seed, you do need that, that license, which we do not have at this point. Gotcha. Uh, question for Jacqueline. Um, <clears throat> was there any movement on the the proposal to allow the dispensaries to sell seeds and, and or clones? So that's a great question. So we really advocated hard for that this year. Uh, Joy uh, Buenaventura was really instrumental in introducing that bill. There was another bill. Uh, there was two um, bills that were uh, really seeds and clones bills and ours kind of died earlier on and the other one was still uh, moving through the process until COVID hit. So we were getting some traction with that. I believe it had moved through three committees. Um, and forgive me for not knowing that bill number off the top of my head, but um, you know, last time it was one of the bills was still alive and it, it did allow for the dispensaries to be able to sell season clones to patients. So uh, we'll continue that you know, as soon as we can. But I think based on the economic, um, you know, impact of what we're all going to be realizing here and have begun to realize. I mean, I think we have to revisit all options, uh, quite frankly. Um, and so, you know, whether it's open access, access for all, whether it's seeds and clones, whatever it is, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, everything's on the table um, for discussion going into next legislative session because it doesn't seem like anyone really has it figured out yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That is, that's really fantastic. Thank you. Some great perspectives there. And I think that we see why it's so important to, uh, to really understand Dr. Otto's work so that we have a foundation from which we can really start to open up medical cannabis. And uh, that's really worth celebrating. And, and thanks everyone for coming together today. Uh, super important discussion and I don't want to stop it. Uh, but we are uh, approaching uh, the 12 o'clock minute or hour, and I'd like to, um, if we could, um, I'm just going to uh, try and unmute everyone um, so that everyone can wave and say thanks, and, uh, and then we'll continue the discussion in about 30 seconds. So thank you, everyone. Give everyone, give yourselves a round of applause. Nice to see you. Making a great event. Yeah, great to see you all Thanks in person. And uh, we also have a guest uh, here with us, uh, Scott Williams. Uh, and uh, Scott has some perspective as well on the differences between regulations here in Hawaii. Scott, if you'd like to uh, say a few words, uh, please help us continue the discussion. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate you guys putting this thing on. I think it's great. And uh, the awareness is just, um, you know, is key for everybody to understand where the current climate is on all the different angles. So, uh, but appreciate you having me. Um, yeah, I, uh, I run a little boutique consulting company, Hawaiian Cannabis Consulting. We focus on, you know, license acquisition. A lot of it is lobbying and government regulations. And I've had, had the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the blessing of being able to see both uh, Maryland regulations and Hawaii regulations so because they almost started identically in the same time frame um, and some of the things that, that uh, Maryland's done a lot better than, than Hawaii um, and maybe a, one or two things that Hawaii's done better but not many um, so yeah so some of the some of the things that I think people should focus on especially with the upcoming legislation in New Year is um, trying to get these regulations changed, right? Um, it's it's always an involvement that happens, you know, through the course of the, of, of of this um, you know this movement, and uh, the market changes, and you have to kind of uh, ch change regulations to based on that market. Um, and while Hawaii has done a great uh, beta program, is what I like to call it, you know, the first couple of years is just kind of beta, is getting the you know getting it off the ground, getting the regulations established. Um, there's a lot of things that can be done better. Um, one of the biggest things that I, and I have, I've, I've had the ability to be a patient both in Hawaii and, 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 and Maryland and be able to see uh, dispensaries on both sides. Um, and uh, some of the things that Hawaii can be done better. Um, one of the biggest things is testing. 
um, is is getting is is requiring um, growers to test um, with terpene profiles, uh, test heavy metals, um, test uh, full microbiology, um, and ensure that you know the medicine that we're getting is clean. Um, there's kind of a, a quasi basic testing right now, but that doesn't really help the patient. So you know there's this there's this, this stigma of this indigo versus sativa, and we're learning that that doesn't really matter anymore, and it doesn't really um, uh, uh, get to the root of the medical the medical benefits, and it's uh, it's all about the terpenes and the terpene profile and the way those things work. Um, and Maryland required all 15 growers to test for terpene profiles. So you walk into a dispensary in Maryland, you can see every test done, and then including that, what's exactly in your medicine. So so patients with Crohn's can look at us, you know, myrcene maybe or a little more limonene, and so they're not looking at just oh you got some indica or some sativa, you know that's not even mentioned almost a lot of the times. It's really based on terpene profiles. So so labs is is key, you know, um, and 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 changing regulations to ensure labs you know adhere to those regulations is key. Um, and expanding that to having more labs. You can't have just one. Um, there's an issue in Maryland right now um, where there's only three labs um, as part of the program. And you happen to see in uh, numbers like 37% THC, 38% THC, where you're barely seeing anything less than 30% on the shelves. Um, we all know that, the, that these lab results are being skewed and that there's a, you know, a, a, a conscience effort to, to get those uh, lab results um, raised. So ensuring that there's an additional market for people to, to test um, from just more than just one, one lab company is, is key. Um, another thing that I think is, is key is with homegrowers in Maryland, uh, homegrowers in Maryland should be able to apply for a micro license and be able to have their medicine tested and sold to the dispensaries, right? Um, any, there's a lot of great growers in, in Hawaii. There's, a, you know, there's established growers for, for decades. They shouldn't have to have a $1.2 million license right, to, to be able to, to, to provide their medicine to their patients. We do have a caregiver program, great, but, you know, it's expensive. You know, sometimes cost doesn't outlandish what you, what you grow. Sometimes there's failures and people lose and they stop growing. Um, so allowing, you know, allowing micro licenses to be so that they can establish uh, uh, dispensaries. Another big one, I will say before I, before I end my, my rant, um, are license numbers, right? Um, you can, you can, uh, Compare the license numbers between Hawaii and almost all the other states, and Hawaii is essentially a monopoly. Um, like, so for example, in Maryland, there's six million people. There's 102 dispensaries. Uh, there should, so based on that, there should be roughly maybe 20 dispensaries minimum in Hawaii. Probably should be more because there's six million visitors every year, and a lot of those are patients. So you should probably double that. So. You're looking at 40 to 50 licenses from dispensaries perspective um, that would open up the market there would be you know it would, it would definitely bring prices down you wouldn't see six dollar eights on the shelves um, these are vertically integrated licenses now holder so so they can they can cultivate this medicine for about three to four dollars a gram so selling it for 15 to 20 dollars a gram is you know it's uh, it's not advantageous to the patient at the end of the day because this is this is medicine and uh, we don't get insurance breaks. We don't have insurance to be able to pay for our medicine and people can't afford thousand dollars worth of medicine every month. So, so some of those things you gotta think about when you talk about, uh, talk to your regulations and talk to your senators and um, some of the things that you might wanna bring up uh, as far as the new regulations for the new coming year. Hold on. I, I do know that the original bill had um, a provision for up to 21 dispensaries licenses in Hawaii. Yeah, I didn't end up. I think there are there's seven fully or fully integrated licenses, and I think each one can have two. So I think it's a maximum of 14, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, well, there no the actual dispensary licenses for the um, individual dispensaries. Initially, they you know said we're going to do what eight. How many we have in the state, right? And they were, you know, they left a provision for that to grow to 21 total, but they just never acted on that. Yeah. And, you know, with the amount of money that costs, I know on this island, you know, Jacqueline probably knows better than I do, but it was, you know, $10 million to yeah. open yeah. the doors. Or so, even yeah. Before the doors open. So this is, and, and I think you're, you know, you guys are bringing up some excellent points. The first thing is we should have a very vibrant, 
reciprocity program, but here again, this is the opportunity. It is anemic at best. I would actually say it's a, it's a failing program. Um, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, the Department of Health in their defense, I could see them doing the very best they can with it. But when you have to go through this process of registration, it's not like in other states where you go and you sign an affidavit, you show your medical card, and you can just immediately gain a, uh, entry to a dispensary. That's not what you do here. You have to pre-register uh, with supporting documents. Uh, you have to, there's a specific time period for when you can actually come um, to, to purchase. I do believe it's upwards of, of three months. Um, you can only renew that one time, I believe. But I mean, without getting stuck in the details of it, yes, there's so much opportunity. I can tell you that on Big Island, there's only about 7,100 registered patients. Now we know that there's way more patients out there on Big Island, but you know, people have been growing and been so self-sufficient for so long. You know, when you look at opening up licenses and all this, you, we just have to look at the numbers and the numbers given the, uh, the investment, you know, it's just one of these things where I can tell you, you know, we have structured this from the beginning Understanding that the lowest uh, median income was on East Hawaii side, you know, we have a $25 eighth all day, every day. So, and it does, we do go up to $50 eighth, but I can tell you we're hitting 33.4% THC on our Kimbo that we just dropped yesterday. And our labs here have to be ISO accredited. There's an ISO 17025 accreditation process. I don't know that all states actually have that requirement for their labs. It's a third party analysis and accreditation process that essentially validates the methodologies uh, for these labs. So it's a whole nother layer. One thing that I do, I can say that we absolutely did right was uh, making sure, whether it's medical or open access when we get there, that people have the right to cons consume clean medicine, clean cannabis. And so uh, I actually advocate for the very high um, testing standards. I think they should be. I think people should know what they get, uh, including terpenes, and I agree with that. And we do actually post our terpene information as well. Um, and so that way they can be, make informed decisions. It's called informed consent. So, uh, but thank you. I just wanted to make a small comment on that if I could. Uh, this is another area where conflict is coming in because dispensaries are having a hard time getting samples to other islands, from my understanding. And actually state law allows dispensaries to transfer uh, to labs, but this, this misconception that, that you guys are violating federal law is another, another uh, impediment, being able to utilize a lab that could maybe do this efficiently that's already ISO accredited and that could reduce your guys' costs. The, the other thing I hope that would change is that, from my understanding, every product has to be tested. So you've got to test your flour, you've got to test your extract, you've got to test your, your lozenge. Uh, I think it could help you guys considerably if there was, you know, the flowers get tested if they pass for the mold and these standards, then that's it, then you're done. And knowing that those are already clean and hopefully having uh, SOPs in place that would prevent any other contaminants being introduced. But I, perhaps by doing something like that, then that would open up the ability to do terpene testing, which I agree would be very helpful for patients. I, I really wish we could get to the uh, Indica uh, discussion. Thank you for that. Jump in real quick. Um, Andrew, uh, how, how do you feel about terpene, flavonoid, or other, other techniques? Uh, is that something that's helpful in a breeding program, for example, or, or is that something that you're happy to do um, through like us on your own? Or how, how does that work for you? Well, it most certainly is helpful in a breeding program. Um, I guess it's all about what your breeding intentions are. Um, but mine certainly is about certain flavors just for my own personal liking. But beyond that, uh, terpenes and flavonoids are, are most definitely medicinal too. And um, so I'm glad you actually chimed in because I wanted to say something. Um, 
I, you know, what Jacqueline said that she's um, she's for the high testing standards, and you know, I may be the outcast by saying this, but I really feel like we're we're really over restrictive um, to the point where these dispensaries are using a machine, and I wish I knew the term for it, but they run, this is not just Hawaii, this is across our nation. They run it through this machine that basically kills all the microbials, and, and uh, at the same time, what it does is it ruins terpenes. Um, and flavonoids, I would argue, I can't say for certain, but it definitely ruins terpenes. Because everything that comes through the machine smells the same. I would argue that you're reducing the medicinal factor. The, the, what I'm saying, I guess, is the risk outweigh the reward when it comes to over restricting our testing standards to the point where people are having to run it through a machine that reduces the quality of medicine by running it through the machine. So patients are getting ripped off of medical benefits that they may receive from, let's just say, just an example, I'm growing something out here in the sun in my yard and I give the same cutting to a dispensary that has to run it through this machine I'm talking about. A patient is gonna get different medicinal effects from both samples of medicine because mine, I can't say it'll pass testing because I usually do not test my stuff, but I, you know, out of a, out of a big garden, I rarely deal with mold because of the streams I'm working with, but I can't say that I'd pass tests. Our, our state's very over restrictive in my personal opinion. So I don't mm -hmm. doubt that I would not pass the test, but you know, is it worth reducing the medicinal benefits of the plant because we're worried about slightly high microbial counts or at least in outdoor um, situations, a little bug food or a bug in general. Um, our food system allows certain percentages of bug and feces in, like, say, canned food. Well, I'd argue that medical cannabis should be the same way, especially if grown out, outside in the sun. You most certainly are going to have a bug that cruises by, whether it decides mm -hmm. to hang out on the plant and live there or not. It's up to the bug, but it might land there for five minutes and poop on a leaf and take off. Well, all of a sudden, that sample's going to fail testing because of that bug pooping on a leaf. Um, I guess I quit rambling, but my argument would be that I'm all for patient safety, and most certainly there should be testing standards. And anything that's going to be entered in public commerce, especially if someone is paying for it, should be tested. Uh, they have every right to have that done. But my argument is that you know, by force, by making the restrictions so restrictive and the testing so, you know, restrictive that we're actually having to reduce medicinal benefits of the flower by being overly restrictive. And does the risk outweigh the reward, I guess, is, is my question. I, I just want to jump in, Jacqueline, just yeah. before uh, you, you answer this or, or, or give us a perspective. Um, I, again, we're right now, we're representing everyone almost, right, in cannabis, right? So we all have our specialties, we all have our areas of focus, and, and I think what Andrew is touching on here um, is really, really close to what patients need. But there's this broad spectrum, right? We've got the immunodeficiencies, the immunocompromise that we're, we're trying to serve. Um, and then we have people, you know, like me who, um, you know, I, I can seem to catch COVID if I wanted to. Um, but my, my, my point, of course, is, is that there's a really wide range that we're, we're trying to accommodate here. And not everyone necessarily needs the high testing standards, and that's why we're able to trade among patients in the home market. So, so with that, Jacqueline, could, can you tell us more about the, the testing and yes. the dispensary? So, so first of all, Andrew, excellent point. 
Um, I want to thank you because you you definitely I completely hear what you're saying, um, and I do agree with the overregulation and the burden. Right? There's a you know I dealt with half a dozen at least plus regulatory and enforcement agencies practicing pharmacy and this does not even touch it i mean what we have to deal with on the compliance side is more than i ever had to you know in dispensing various controlled substances over the course of 15 plus years so um you know in that respect yes i think there's some some areas for significant improvement and i do believe in some areas that it is overregulated. having said that you know i am no matter what a pharmacist first so my perspective about testing standards and brett brent thank you for um acknowledging like the immunocompromised patients i think when i say those things i'm thinking of hospice patients thinking of immunocompromised patients people that are undergoing chemo uh that you know even from a pharmacy perspective are really um at risk for, for even the most for other people you know benign issues. Um, and so when I say that, I say that in the spirit of, of being able to serve um, patients that I, that I truly feel, you know, really need it. Um, and as far as terpenes and having to jump through these hoops, you know, we've had to see this thing of, uh, as a way of getting better, right? And when I say that is like, you know, we had all these complexities of security requirements and testing requirements and all of these other cobweb of, of, of regulation that we had to jump through and we've done it and and every time something like this hits we see it as an opportunity to get better and to up our game so we would you know we're focused on trying to get our terpenes you know content up and, and having the best quality flower that we can and just to I didn't mean to overstate just the THC portion of it you know but I'm really proud of the team we have I want you guys to know that you know we have a team of patients people from Pune, people from Hamakua, who have been in the culture, been in cannabis for many years, and this has been an avenue for them for legitimacy, um, and, and, and now they're able to kind of transition their skill set um, into, you know, into, uh, into what we do, and so I'm really super proud of them, and we all care about um, the passion for the plant and the patients, um, you know, so one thing I, I can speak with confidence about. So as far as terpenes, yes, we got to get better. The, 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 state, the state testing is super strict. Um, I said that with the spirit of being a pharmacist and for immunocompromised patients. And we just have to figure it out and with work within that. As far as a dispensary is concerned, I mean, there's so much liability and everything else involved we in, in that respect you know I, I like that it's tested I like that they're testing every aspect of it and that you know you know people should not be able to spray pesticides and stuff on their cannabis that people or patients are consuming so I don't um, you know I don't make a, an excuse for that that's how I feel thank you thank you Jackie that was super super helpful really appreciate that and we have some more perspective Hey everybody, I, I just wanted to say I've got to get going. Um, and uh, it's been a real honor to, to be part of this event today. I really appreciate everything that everyone's putting into this. It's a very complex issue. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad uh, that Brent was able to bring all these different perspectives together. Uh, and I hope we can work together for the benefit of our patients. So with that, I'm gonna to have to sign off. Great job, Cliff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Aloha, everybody. Aloha, Cliff. Aloha from Hilo.